doctor. Okay, so tell me about your new play. Um, I was diagnosed on the 19th of December. 19th of December, 2000. Are we in 2012 now? Mm -hmm, yeah, 2011 mm -hmm. with cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, and it actually turned out after some misdiagnoses to be uterine cancer. I was quite aggressive and it had some metastasis and so there was quite a sort of a, a time when I felt like I was, um, what's that the thing that planes do when they're flying over a city and they can't land? Mm -hmm. Circling. Yeah. yeah, I was sort yeah. of circling my life in a mm -hmm. fog, you know, and it was a very strange time, but I started to write at that time. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't very sure what I was doing, but I was writing and I was looking at life as something that may have to be stretched you know if i had just a few months mm -hmm. that's going to be my lifetime and i'm going to stretch it mm -hmm. right and try and understand things mm -hmm. so i got in a funny kind of way i was reborn as a new person with mm -hmm. cancer and um, so i uh, went through the a year an entire year with uh, surgery radiation chemotherapy and um, a huge amount of uh, thrills because I was treatable, maybe even curable. There was, you know, we moved, I, I felt myself moving forward and actually, hey, I got my birthday. Hey, you know, my grandchildren's birthday. I'm, I'm here for this, you know, I'm still here. Um, but the scuba diving metaphor is still there too. I mean, it's a very important one where you actually, where I felt um, that uh, somehow underwater, I was seeing all these beautiful, extraordinary, magnificent, stunning things. Mm -hmm. But I also had to, um, I had to measure out the oxygen in my tank as mm -hmm. well. You know, I, had, I had a job to do. I discovered that people loved me, and I think I spent so much of my life working on me loving people that I hadn't actually opened myself up to how people loving me. Mm -hmm. And this was a, an amazing thing. So, and then I walked into Princess, and I walked into Princess Margaret Hospital, and I looked around at all these people, all different ages, all different stages, mm -hmm. and it was quiet, and there was a lot of smiling in this hospital, mm -hmm. and even moments of humor and all that, there was no panic. That's a ho If you want to go to a place where nobody panics, go into Princess Market. It's the most extraordinary thing. Mm -hmm. And I said to my husband, these are my people. These are going to be my people for the rest of my life, no matter what happens to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I read only one book about cancer because I was not studying it. I was busy surviving it. Mm -hmm. Um, and this book about cancer had a chapter about a clinical trial for breast cancer, a breast cancer drug uh, that was extraordinary. It was, it was a possi the possibility that one of the, the most aggressive forms of death, death, breast cancer could actually be cured and beaten back by a particular drug. And the women were all brought in to, to get treated together at the same time. And it's a lonely business getting chemo. You're all by yourself in your little chair, and everyone's all by themselves. But this was a community of women, and one of them had a visible tumor. So the first thing they would do at the beginning of their treatments, they would be, they'd touch her tumor to see if it had shrunk. Mm -hmm. So I got so excited and intrigued by who these women are who feel that they're going to get rescued by this possible new drug. But then who's this doctor? who's using these women's bodies and using their illnesses to try to save the world. Mm -hmm. um, and the clash between women who feel they're being rescued and a doctor who has a bigger agenda than that. Mm -hmm. And so I started exploring all these women. That's when I coined the term, I've got a multiple choice personality, because seven women in this play have got different forms of cancer and they're all different ages. Several of them are fairly, you know, over 55, which I'm thrilled about. You know, it's mm -hmm. great for the actresses, all these yes. actresses. Yeah. Um, and there's a doctor and there's a nurse in it. And I found myself able to have this incredible conversation with people zigging r around the room, like all kind of, keep, you know, catch, I don't know, it's just thrilling. But I also learned that when I got cancer, I became a, fi a file number. I became a file number. I have a hospital number, a hospital card number. Um, I have a health card number. I have an, a, a birth date number. They would do nothing to you until, they, until you say 14749, my birth date. They won't, they won't touch you. They won't draw blood, nothing. And I started to discover that I was a, a collection of statistics that were as real as Maya. 63-year-old postmenopausal menopausal woman. Mm -hmm. And that's how it starts. And there's a name. And then my file is this thick. And I started to think about the tension between that and the messy, fleshy, life and death, 
world of these women. So that's what I wrote, and I'm, it's pouring out of me. It's a play that doesn't feel like any of the other plays. And I feel like I understand them, and I could never have written this play if I hadn't gotten cancer. I do have to tell you I'm cancer-free at this moment, so this is good. Cancer graduate. But the play still lives in me, and I want it to somehow serve. I want the play itself to serve. So at this point in time, the readings have been very exciting and rich, and I'm... Um, getting some funding for it, and <laughs> something's going to happen. Oh, absolutely. No, and no. I don't care that nine women in it. <laughs> I don't care there's too many actors and nobody can afford it. We'll do it. Oh, let's talk about that for a second. Do you ever let, um, you know, when you're writing, at the very beginning of writing your play, do you let financial constraints affect you, or do you let anything can affect you? Like Because you, everybody, every writer wants to get their play done. And having eight actors sometimes can be a challenge for that, or nine actors or whatever. Yeah, do I think, think this is the first time I've been faced with the question. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was going to do Prisoner of Turan, I always knew that if it was going to happen at all, it had to be with a small cast. So in some ways that is a constraint, mm -hmm. small multiple choice, multiple uh, role playing cast. Mm -hmm. um, but in this particular case, I feel like a revolutionary. I feel I feel a bit pushy about it. And mm -hmm. I'm actually, I've sent some emails to, to, to artistic directors saying it has a large cast and I don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. Um, because frankly, the people that are reading it say, well, We'll do this, whatever it takes to get it done, we'll, do, we'll be there to do this play. And so, yes, of course, we're going to hunt for money. If, 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 if no theater wants to do it, mm -hmm. then we, my little theater contrary company will do it, mm -hmm. and we will hunt for money. And when we hunted for money for Prisoner of Tehran, mm -hmm. we did extremely well, and we're well, well supported, and we will just do it again. It's the spirit of your mother, isn't it? I guess so. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how uh, to be any other way. Someone said that about me in the middle of the cancer thing. They said you're very positive and all the rest of it. I don't. I, I don't have a choice. I actually. Mm -hmm. I think I'm just am this way. I don't know any other way. Talk to me about commu community theater. Oh uh, well, the other exciting thing is that I've just recently been asked to write a play for Fourth Line Theater. Mm -hmm. Fourth Line Theater started many years ago, kind about thirty or something. Anyway. Um, and they started by having professional actors working with tons and tons of local community members to create big epic plays telling the stories of the area of um, the Cavan Township near Peterborough. And as, um, when I was younger, a young professional actor, I was very snotty about people that did theater and then, what, they're charging ticket prices and they're just amateurs? How dare they? We have to live by this. I have to feed my children. I'm different. Right? And um, in some ways I was right, you know, that we did have to fight for the status of professional, uh, theater professional, and we should keep fighting for that. That is an important thing to fight for. But in a sense, I think we were so divided from people that do it for the love that something had to change. And I think as times got more difficult and times changed and theater started in some ways to hunker down and be less open to um, the community around them because they could afford less or boards were becoming more difficult or whatever, market. Um, uh, fourth Line Theater chugged along with this open air theater in a barnyard um, and the local community were so I mean, they, they would have as many people as they liked in their shows because the local community was just given nominal fees because they were so thrilled to be part of the project, mm -hmm. right? But the professional actors were given equity, equities and fees. And somehow it all looks like this incredible success story. So from a few years back being told that you guys are a bit weird, you know, using the community, now everyone's going, you're using the community. What a wonderful way to keep theater alive. Mm -hmm. So I think this actual model needs to be explored far better and far further by more theaters. I, as a theater creator, have always taught. And I've always wanted children to be, part, you know, people of all ages to be around, you know, the work I do. Um, I loved YPT because it had a relationship with the community and, you know. Um, so for me, as a, as, as a creative person, I don't want to be behind any walls anymore. I want, to, and that's why I enjoy being part of the um, uh, Theatre Pass Marai world. I'm a resident artist there because they're trying to crack open that thing too. And how do, how are they doing it? By looking into the community of the tiny little groups of theatre creators and saying, "What do you got? Come on over," you know. Um, now there's a negative side to all that, where I felt when we were starting our little theatre company that we were the kind of developing nation. And the theater, the established theaters, they are the um, 
the, 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 the first world, the, the, you know, the Western world, and they just liked, they get to come shopping to, to, our, to our little companies because we did all the work for no money, and now we've got a product, and now, now they can bring it in. Um, but, that, but, but what we've also done is we've permeated the community. This, it's the small theater companies that seem to be you know, back and sort of involved, far more involved with the community around themselves. I don't think there's too many ivory towers anymore. We know they don't work. Mm. That was a very muddled and long answer, but... Um, no, no, no. Um, tell me about your company. Contrary Company is called Contrary because the three women sitting around the table that started it were called Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously you were all quite contrary. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. And then, oh, Contrary, that's perfect. Contrary mm. Company. No one ever is going to call themselves Contrary. Contrary Company is just a small group of women who have a website. Mm. And we have a designer and we have um, actors and a producer, Kim, Kim Blackwell and Mary Frances Moore is involved. And, uh, Julia Tribe, the designer, and we are um, a, a group of women who want to create women-led work, women-led work. Mm -hmm. uh, the subject matter is whatever, we, whatever we find interesting. And we come and we form ourselves when there's a project to be done. When there's a project to be done, we wake up and make the project happen. And then we go dormant between projects. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, there's a Canada Council grant that could have us able to be administratively ongoing mm -hmm. for little companies like ours. Mm -hmm. So we'll look into that. But in a sense, we sort of survive and, you know, we, I mean, there's something kind of interesting about being that way, you mm -hmm. know. And we try to get grants, and sometimes we do. Most of the time we do. Our, our success, success rate is very high at this point in time. But hey, the competition gets more and more. That's true, I'm sure, but I'm sure you'll be very successful in the future. But we produced uh, You Fancy Yourself, um, the tour of Cure for Everything, which went to L.A. and stuff, and also uh, the big one, in, in many ways, is Prison of Turin. Final thing is, um, I'm sure there are people watching you who want to know how do you do it? How do you stay so active and so, and keep working? There are young actresses who want to know. How to get make it in the business? I know, as a matter of fact, one of my students was asking me, "Well, how can I be an actress?" I, she has a very thick accent, actually, and she's like, "Well, what, what do I do as a as a Canadian actor with an accent? How do I, how do I get work? How do I survive?" There are actresses who are no longer in their thirties, or like, "How do I keep going?" So, what advice do you have for other performers out there? Don't don't acknowledge authorities. Richard Rose and um, Matthew Jocelyn are not the authority in your creative life. Mm -hmm. They exist for, uh, and may have some opportunities that are available to you at, at times, but you are the only authority in your creative life. Make your own mandate. What are your values? What are the fundamental decisions that you really, really want to make? in you know, being a creative person. And don't see the lack of work as rejection, just see it as room, f room for launching yourself. Brilliant. Well said. Okay, thank you, Maya. That was wonderful.